G'day Internet, welcome back to another video. Today we are taking a look at this ZX Spectrum. Now this particular specy is uh, special in a couple of ways which we will get to uh, as the video progresses. Um, but it is boxed, which is net nice. Uh, I've never actually had a boxed Spectrum before. Uh, and it did come with some nice accessories, uh, which were, well, at least one good accessory, uh, which again, we will get to. So let's start by seeing what's in the box. So kind of standard uh, box for a Spectrum. Uh, inside, if I can open it up, right. We have our nice original uh, foam inserts. In pretty good condition too. I mean, they're not broken, they're not cracked or anything like that. Uh, inside we have our actual spectrum. We'll get to that in a minute. We've got some literature. We've got the introduction to ZX Spectrum. Uh, and uh, the ZX Spectrum basic programming manual. Other than that, we've got uh, our original power supply here. Uh, this has a UK plug on it. Uh, we also have our cassette lead uh, and our RF lead as well. I think about the only thing missing from this is the Horizon CD. CD, cassette, um, come on. Uh, but I think I might actually have one somewhere. I'll have to uh, see if I can dig it out before I finish this video. So that's what's all in the box. If we have a look at the actual machine, here it is, a very well preserved rubber key spectrum. And we get to the first reason why I think that this is uh, a little special. You may have noticed it on the box, but it's a 16K model. Now, the reason I'm considering that special is that from what I can understand, the vast majority of 16K machines over the years have been upgraded to 48K because it's actually a fairly simple job. This one, I believe, still contains its original 16K setup. And the reason I think that is the case is, hang on, with it was the accessory that I was talking about, and that is this. This is a Cheetah 32K external RAM expansion. Now, what my brain tells me is that you wouldn't have this if this was 48K. Um, well, it just wouldn't work. Um, so this is the Cheetah 32K RAM expansion, which we'll have a play with later on. It does have a pass-through, which is kind of nice. Uh, it does have its uh, little manual or service information. There you go, with the, uh, here we go, Cheetah 32K memory test program. And if you run that, it will tell you if you're running 16K or 48K. So we'll give that a try later on. This is also in there. And this seems to be the original receipt for purchasing this RAM expansion. And it's from Rother Cameras uh, Sonic Photo Center, Tottenham Court in London. Uh, does it have a date on it? Oh yeah. Uh, seven something 1983 for one 32k cheetah ram pack for the grand total of 39 pounds and 95 pence. That's, oh, it was paid for by check. That's actually really cool to have. That will definitely be staying uh, in the little box with the ram expansion. Now, the seller told me that this has basically been sitting boxed up for the last 25 years. So, does it still work? Uh, we kind of find out. Um, I will test the original power supply, although we probably won't use it. Um, and then 
we'll do some tests on the actual machine to see what we're going with. So, testing the original power supply. Remember that uh, a Spectrum uses a center negative plug, unlike most, which is center positive. Uh, and if we test it, we get a bit over 13 volts, which for an unregulated power supply uh, is fairly normal. But even with testing the original power supply, I think I am just gonna go ahead and uh, use a modern one. This is a modern nine volt power supply, um, mainly for my own peace of mind. And once again, just to reiterate, this actually has a little label on it to show you how you need to line up the plug. Uh, to make sure that you are doing it center negative. Uh, and on this one, it's a case of lining up the little minus that's on the side of the plug. You may not be able to see that uh, with the plus that's on the actual barrel. And that should be right. And just because I'm a little paranoid, let's just make sure that we've got that the right way. Uh, center negative. And there's a nice 9.2 volts out of the modern power supply. Next thing I want to do is to pull the cover uh, off the Speccy and let's just take a look around inside. Five screws on the back. Obviously being careful to uh, disconnect the membrane for the keyboard carefully. Come on. Right, one and two. They're actually not in horrible shape, but we'll put that to one side. And here we are inside the Speccy. And as suspected, this is a 16K model. I find it interesting that they went to the trouble of putting in all the sockets um, still in a 16K model. They didn't just leave them out, but that's kind of beside the point. The next thing I wanna do is to uh, check for some shorts um, and then we'll put some power to it and see what it's doing. Right, standard. Right, good, multimeters working. Um, let's check the power regulator first. No, we seem to be good. And we're good there. Let's get the actual board out. Uh, and we can easily check for shorts actually on a RAM chip uh, because we should have, um, I'm just trying to think which one's which now. I know we've got five, 12, or is it 12, five and minus five. And I think ground is the top right pin. No, we're good. We're good. And we're good. Okay, we don't seem to have any obvious shorts. So I think it's time to put some power to the old girl. Modern power supply, off we go. Okay, let's see what voltages we have. Untangle my cables. Right, we should have, hmm, we've got, 8.29 there, we've got 4.8 there. We should have 12, I would have thought there, and we've got nothing where there should be uh, minus five. Now, if memory serves me right, minus five is generated by TR4, which is just here. And if I come round, we should get that's our nine volt, I believe, coming straight in from the power supply, and we should get minus five coming out of here. And we don't. Right, so straight up, I think we have a faulty um, TR4. So before we go any further, I think I wanna swap out that TR4. Now this is a weird uh, transistor, it's like a ZTX, something, 651, I think. Um, I don't have any on hand, but I've got 
another couple of speckies kicking around and hopefully there's one in those that I can, uh, well, steal at least to get this machine up and running for this video. All right, a little bit of screwing around later. We have a known working ZTX651. Uh, so let's get that guy out and get this guy in. Righto, one transistor swapped. Let's see what our voltages look like now. Right, power in. And, right, we've got, well, there's our 12 volt back. Uh, five volt and minus five or minus 4.7, right. I'm happy with the voltages now on this board. Before I actually go plug this into a monitor, I am, and it's the only modification I intend to do this to this machine, is I am going to do a composite mod on it. Doing a composite mod on a Speccy, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. Some people just use a straight wire, some people use a transistor. Um, this particular one, I'm just simply gonna do the capacitor one. Um, so first things first, we need to get the lid off this. Come on. Right. The next thing I want to do is disconnect the two wires that are coming out of the bottom. Uh, and I tend to just do that with a soldering iron and a small pair of pliers. See if I can do this on camera. Right, there's one. And nearly there, two, right. So they're now disconnected. Right, this is simply a 16 volt 100 UF uh, capacitor. Uh, on this, the positive lead goes uh, to the middle pin just here that we just disconnected. Well, sorry, if I'm looking at it, it's the leftmost pin uh, and uh, the other lead goes through and connects to the phono jack. So the other thing we need to then do is there is a resistor inside which is connected to the center pin of the phono jack. We just need to disconnect that and just kind of bend it out of the way. Again, uh, positive lead of the capacitor, we will just put down through this hole just here. Maybe I'll be lucky and not have to bust out uh, the Moo gun again. There we go. And if we're really tricky, we should be able to kind of feed that through. Come on. And we can sit it just like that. I'll just put a fresh uh, blob of solder on the bottom to make sure that we have a nice join. I haven't destroyed a pad or something. Snip off the leg. And all we need to do now is carefully feed the negative leg through the empty grommet. Now, quick one, not all of the RF cans have got plastic grommets here. So if you don't, uh, put a little bit of uh, heat shrink on this leg that I'm feeding through, right? That sits nicely like that. Uh, and then I will put a dot of solder where that meets the pin of the phono jack and snip off the little bit of extra leg that's inside and pray I don't drop it, I didn't. Quick composite mod done. We can now plug this into a telly uh, and see what it's doing. Okay, now that we've composite modded this thing, I can plug in video. Let's plug in power, see what it's doing. Hey, it booted. 
Nice. Picture quality is a little rubbish. Uh, let's see if we can tune that out a bit. Right, now, if I remember correctly, these two potentiometers here, the top one has to do with timings and the bottom one has to do with color. I reserve the right to be horribly wrong. So I'm not having much luck trying to tune this uh, video signal in, even with some contact cleaner on these pots. I suspect we may have a marginal ULA and it's getting quite warm. So as suspected, I just swapped the ULA for another one and the picture has come good. It's actually pretty good for a composite signal, I've got to admit. So we seem to have a working 16K spectrum. Um, so that's this bit done. What about that bit over there? So let's put the keyboard back on and see what, you know, 30 years on an original membrane is like. I'm not, let's be honest, I'm not holding my breath. Although I'm still gonna be as careful as I can. Right, video back in, power, Whoa. Right, some of it seems to work. Why did it jump straight to plot? Well, enter certainly doesn't uh, work. L, Q doesn't work. Right. I, uh, somewhere here, think I have a replacement membrane. The hard part is, is removing this faceplate without trashing it, because I'd like to keep this machine, well, with the exception of the composite mod, as original as possible. So, and that means keeping this quite mint faceplate together with the rest of the machine. So, that's gonna be my next challenge. So I reached out on Twitter last night going, hey, anybody got any tips for removing these faceplates without trashing them? The general consensus seems to be uh, heat and being incredibly gentle because this is incredibly thin aluminium uh, and kinks just by looking at it. So um, I did actually get linked to one of Mark Fixer Stuff's videos up in the corner. Um, and his suggestion is to start with heat down one side and then essentially do what I call the ice cube tray maneuver. Um, because at the end of the day, the plastic will find its original shape uh, a lot better than the aluminium on here. So I have uh, borrowed Jess's hairdryer because it's certainly not mine. Um, this is very loud. Uh, so here we go. And according to Mark, give it a bit of a bend and you can see, you might be able to see that edge starting to move, right? We then get uh, a little plastic pry piece like this. This is just out of a cheap uh, mobile phone repair kit. Um, and, but I do have some other tools here if I need it. Apply some more heat. and get the sharp edge of this pry tool up underneath and kind of slide it across. What you're not, you're not trying to lift the metal, you're trying to break the adhesive. So if we bring that across, kind of, how do I put it, slowly, but with a little bit of kind of, oomph behind it, but you don't want to be, you don't want to reef on it, put it that way, okay? 
and then we start working our way along the front. Again, trying to get this little tool in underneath. It's easier to get the tool in underneath around here because there's a bit of a gap. Along the front, not so much. Oh, hang on a sec. I've got a bit of a lip along the top. So just so you know, the sticky tape tends to be down here, down here, down here, and a little bit along the top. So that's kind of what we're aiming at. All right, I managed to find a bit of a lip here. I'm gonna do this while keeping it on camera. There we go, right. Getting it nicely along there. How's this side going? All right, start working this side now. Just gently, gently but firmly. Right, can we get that to lift a bit? Not really. We're trying to do everything we possibly can to not bend the aluminium. All right, it's lifting quite well at the back. I also don't want to go anywhere near this with any sharp tools. I might try this guy. All right, we're definitely free here. Yep. I'm just, I actually am lifting, but I'm kind of lifting from this point here, not down the back. Whoop. Okay. I think that side's up, that side's up. All right. We're still very much stuck at the front. Just need to get a start on it. Got it. Right, and I should now be able to slide that All right. This is heated, this isn't. Come on. Whoop. I think I still managed to kink it a little. Come on. All right. Got it. Right, I think we're free. We are, nice. May not be able to see that, but I did still manage to kink it a smidge, but it's not, how do I put this? It's a kink. Uh, that's okay, I think I just fixed it, right. In the sense that it was a bulge, not like a kink, um, which you've at least got half a chance of straightening out. And at the end of the day, when the new adhesive goes on, it kind of holds everything into place. Right. Um, our rubber mat, which is actually, look how seriously, given that this is the original one, I doubt this machine's ever been apart before, 
Look how clean that mat is. That's insane. Right, so now the membrane can come out. In theory, if it didn't get caught. Right, old membrane gone. I'm just gonna spend a little bit of time removing uh, the adhesive from the plastic. I don't want to try and remove it from the back of the metal because you're just asking to kink or scratch or if you use any kind of solvent, damage the paint. Just gonna leave this. All right, next thing I wanna do is I wanna put some uh, new double-sided sticky tape down uh, on the underside of the face plate uh, as soon as I can find the edge for it. There we go. Uh, and I want yay much. Make sure you don't go over the edge of the face plate because otherwise it will obviously be visible sticking out the side. So there actually isn't any adhesive along the top, which well kind of explains a few things. So we can bring our top half of the case back in. Uh, make sure I've got this round the right way. Yes, like that. Slide the two ends through. Line it up with all the various notches. Our key mat can go back in. In all its dead flesh glory. Uh, and now the face plate, once I remove the backing of the double side sticky tape, no, that removed just the sticky tape. Come on, no. I hate double-sided sticky tape for this very reason. Hey, got an edge. And make sure we don't do something stupid like try and put it on upside down. Carefully line this up over the buttons so they don't get caught. Because they can get caught. And Press it down where we've put adhesive, especially down the sides. Look at that. I'm pretty happy with that. Right. Should we see if it actually works? Okay, once again, being very careful, let's plug the keyboard into the main board. Even though this is brand new, doesn't matter. Close it up. Give ourselves some video and some power. Helps if the TV was on. Oh! That's not right. It's typing shit. Well, I've got a space bar. But it's not behaving. I wonder, it's just typing on its own. I wonder if the ULA that I put into this has another fault. Right, ULA number three, I've got a good video and it's not randomly typing. So let's try the keyboard again. I wonder if the original membrane was actually okay and it, I was looking at weird ULA problems. Right. Hey, that's better. Look at that. Print works. I'm happy with that. So the next thing I want to have a look at is actually this RAM expansion, A, to see if it works, but B, I'm actually quite curious about that little program that was written uh, on this sheet. This one just here. So I'm going to tear my hair out for a minute and attempt to type this into here. Uh, and in theory at the moment, it should come back with 16.
run. 16K of memory. And I only needed the manual once. So let's plug this thing in, see if it works. Right. Well, I think that's actually positive because it actually took a smidge longer to boot up. So let me tear my hair out and type that in again. 48K of memory. It works. So with the machine all up and running, that brings me to, I guess, back in the day, what would you do with this machine? Well, obviously you would play games, but the other main use would be something like learning basic. And in with the machine was this book. This is the 30 hour basic course uh, by Clive uh, Prigmore. Um, this is the Spectrum edition. Uh, adapted by a gentleman by the name of Paul Shreve. And it actually brings me on to what makes this particular machine a little special, at least to me. Go back a few days. A uh, mate of mine sends me a link to a local Gumtree ad uh, advertising actually a whole other computer uh, by a gentleman by the name of David. Uh, so I sent her a message going, hey, uh, interested in the machine, it was dirt cheap, um, when can I come get it? Uh, he's like, here's my mobile number, give me a call, we'll sort it out. Gave him a call, um, got chatting, and he's like, oh, we've got this other machine here as well, it's a ZX Spectrum, Do you, are you interested in that? And I thought to myself, well, you know, can't have too many Spectrums, really, can you? Um, and so uh, we came up with the price, a fairly cheap one, um, and I came home with the Spectrum as well. But when I was talking to him, he's like, oh, I might not actually be there. Uh, here's the mobile number uh, to my wife, Ruth. Uh, she's more likely to be home. So just call her in case she doesn't answer the door or whatever. So I rock up um, to a very nice place in South Canberra, uh, knock on the door and Ruth answers it. Uh, invites me in, shows me this and the other machine. Uh, and we kind of, you know, we start talking. And I mentioned the fact that I work at the University of Canberra. I've been there for 16-ish years, thereabouts, been there a while. Um, and she said, oh, I used to work at UC as well. And we got talking. Ruth just isn't Ruth. Uh, Ruth turns out to be Dr. Ruth Foxwell, um, who hold, held many senior positions uh, during her time uh, at UC, uh, including uh, what the equivalent of uh, the dean of the faculty that I work for. Um, but she uh, worked there for many years in very senior roles, directly answering to the vice chancellor, things like that. And um, I just, I couldn't believe that I happened to just walk into this, per this random house uh, and this person that I'd heard all these stories about at work, um, there she was. So I actually text messaged um, a couple of uh, colleagues of mine who have been at UC even longer, um, Robert uh, and my former Dean uh, Demendra, and I went, hey, do you, because I took a photo, do you recognize this face? And they're like, Oh my God, that's uh, Ruth Foxwell. Um, and Robert then started telling me stories of all these just amazing things that Ruth did and how wonderful she was and a great person to work with. And Demendra um, was telling me that she was a real champion for IT within UC and all these wonderful things. And she actually then got telling me that this is the book she bought and the computer she bought in the early 80s to teach herself BASIC. Now, after leaving UC, uh, Ruth went on to have an amazing career with the WHO, um, and far as I'm aware, is now happily retired and enjoying life. Um, and so, yes, this, from that little, it has, it has providence, it has a story, and for me, that actually makes it really special. Um, and look, I've got other Spectrums, I've got my own rubber key, I've got a Plus 2, I've got the Omni that I showed a little while back. Um, 
So this is actually going to go on display at work with a little bit of a story. Um, so that's where this very special to me um, ZX Spectrum is going to end up. And I'm just, it's kind of like it's come home to UC. Well, not really because she bought this back in England. But it's nice to have a reminder of Ruth on display at the University of Canberra. So that kind of brings this video to a close. We've fixed uh, the few little faults that were in this machine, obviously the bad membrane. Uh, we ended up having a dodgy ULA, I oh, know, shock, right? Uh, and uh, a blown TR4 transistor, again, shock, I know. Um, but now it is a very happy little spectrum. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, click like, subscribe, all the usual YouTube-y stuff. As always, a massive shout out to my Patreons who are scrolling up the screen as I speak. Uh, and if you'd like to help support the channel, there is a link in the description. But until then, I'll see you in the next one.